coming up for air on reading poetry to breathe in a global pandemic. On the 13th of March, 2020, I was sent home from the Faculty of Education at York University in Toronto, Canada, shortly after the entire country went into lockdown. For months, the news had been warning about a mysterious and potentially deadly illness circulating across the globe, resembling the common cold of our childhood. The virus was reported to attack the lungs and literally suck out the air out of the people it struck. A secularly raised daughter of yoga and mantra practicing Hindus, I was schooled from a young age on the importance of breathing, the necessity of breath. Breath, I was taught, is critical to well-being, to health, and to the mind, caretaker of the body. As the thought of breath grips the world, as climate change, racial injustice, and a global pandemic converge to suck oxygen, the life force, out of the earth, I find it strange that many scholars are speaking about anything but. This paper will deliberate these educational thoughts and insights on breath. The idea of breath seems to elude many educational scholars submerged in the world of research of methods and proof, triangulation, and pattern analysis. My own feeling is that none of this means that much if one can't breathe or if one is preventing others from doing so. In her time in the wake of the Vietnam War, Maxine Green made a similar argument, ironically drawing upon Camus' novel The Plague to do so. She said, I am suggesting that young people be empowered to ponder new possibilities, alternatives to destruction and war. They must be enabled to speak with their own voices, tell their own stories, and yes, to love the world. I shall turn to Albert Camus because his words are so very spare and pure. Camus wrote, the task is endless, it's true, but we are here to pursue it. We have not overcome our condition and yet we know it better. We know that we live in contradiction, but we also know that we must refuse this contradiction and do what is needed to reduce it. Our task is to find the few principles that will calm the infinite anguish of free souls. We must mend what has been torn apart, make justice imaginable again in a world so obviously unjust, give happiness and meaning once more to peoples poisoned by the misery of this century. Naturally, it is a superhuman task. But superhuman is the term for tasks men ta take a long time to accomplish. That's all. Let us know our aims then. Holding fast to the mind, even if force puts on a thoughtful or a comfortable face in order to seduce us. The first thing is not to despair. To not despair is also to take a, a deep breath and think. My work during this time of trying not to despair is also a work of thinking. I have understood deeply that knowledge that is significant to our existence is the kind that carries the breath of all living things. Even though this has been the most unthinkable time of my life, I am also not surprised. I have argued for the last three decades that cognitive, instrumental, and forma formulaic literacies of reading and learning have given way to limited, diminished, and depressed interpretive capacities in engaging ourselves, others, and the world. In my book, Literacy of the, of the Other, I make a case to rethink literacy as key to a personal subject formation and capacities to make meaning of the world and others. To be made recognizable to others, I write, children must express their need in intelligible form to another who lovingly accepts and carefully returns their faltering symbolic constructions. To really hear children, I further find, requires the capacity for poetry, for engaging language through its affective forms as well as its symbolic ones. As a result, and as we can see today, the global citizenry shows increasing apathy towards each other's social and political conditions. I attribute this rise as much to the decline in critical and sympathetic reading capacities of citizens as it is a feature of a resurgence of white supremacy returning us to archaic colonial mindsets. Paulo Freire and Jacques Derrida argue differently that how we learn to read and write the word, others in the world, significantly impacts on how we can engage fictions of the social reality that dominant powers create and immerse us in. Derrida urges us to deconstruct the dominant logics institutionalizing hierarchies of difference between humans and animals.
To unravel the myth of whiteness requires poetic reading or metaphorical reading to surface and make examinable the layered meanings consolidating whiteness as magically proper to real human being. For Paulo Freire, reading the world always precedes reading the word, and reading the word implies reading the world. Learning to read, he adds, must be viewed as non-instrumental and creative act. Leaning back to childhood, Freire finds that reading arises with his earliest memories of being human in the world with others. For me, the task has never been greater for scholars of the educational humanities to develop what Paulo Freire called a literacy that brings about a humanizing education. As with Freire, I too find that literacy engages the poetic in an infant speech as the first conditions of our life. Freire falls to childhood memories of learning to read and recapture affective intensities of learning to read. In my work, I go a little bit further back than childhood to unconscious infancy to reclaim poetry as our first language. Poetry is the language that animates our very animal beginnings. The baby's first breath takes the shape of the O, which is the last shape the human mouth makes before it dies. The affect imprinted in words and unconsciously transferred in reading that make communication hard, that make my ways of speaking and being different than yours, require poetic reading. With the death of his daughter Sophie, Freud found himself inconsolable and without inner resources to make sense of her senseless death. During this time, he turned to the work of the imagination to write The Pleasure Principle, a piece that Rose describes as, quote, moving between elegy and treatise, between sorrow and science, end of quote. Finding himself in the throes of existential crisis and the idea that we humans are as much aimed towards death as we are life, Freud fought against this awful thought by finding solace and strength, quote, in our belief by the writing of our poets, end of quote. In all of my readings of great thinkers living through the previous pandemic and now during this time, I am convinced by the claims of medical doctor Chris Fitzpatrick writing for the Irish Times. Only the poets, he writes, will be able to make any sense of this. In time, we will need poets and writers of the imagination to look through the looking glass and tell us the stories of this strange upside down world. We will need more than a vaccine and a rebooted economy to heal us. I tend to agree. In my teaching with students, I have taken to reading poetry before my lectures as a way to prepare for how to think about teaching during this time. I recently read that medical doctor Fatty Joda, who is also a poet, does the same. He notes, quote, On the second day of the pandemic, I cut up the rest of the branches, deepened the earth for the fig, enjoyed a long, lazy lunch with my parents, and on the way home heard a radio report on whether the sky is bluer during a pandemic. A child of Palestinian refugees finds, as I do, that poetry is healing and helps redress the displacements he had experienced personally in terms of his health and a person caught in social political histories. Quote, being a poet and a writer and hopefully a better listener, I have, used to learn, I have learned to use the language of faith or hope, or support, or terseness sometimes, to commu communicate with my patients better." End of quote. Many of the poets, writers, thinkers, ushering in modernism were struck down by the flu. T.S. Eliot claimed his bout with the flu and that of his wife, Marie, altered his mind forever. He wrote The Wasteland after it was over. It is a poem featuring Marie and a wasteland of despair that also turned in the end to breath sung in the Hindu mantras of my childhood dreams. These fragments I have shored against my ruin. Why then I'll fit you? Hieronymi's mad again. Data, diadvadam, damyata, shanti, shanti, shanti. And now when I read the lines, April is the cruelest month, I too understand the poem differently with its images of death and dying or a world in complete lockdown that made no sense. He who is living is dead, we who are living are now dying. Now I read what is that sound high in the air, and I feel it all around me, a mother's grief. And now I hear the murmur of maternal lamentation in my mother's daily dispatches on what will happen now, Mamuni, delivered by landline with a sound so palatable, I can feel it across the wires. How did the wasteland see our catastrophe, one rot in the middle of another pandemic? 
could pinpoint its multi-species sources, could prophesize this wasted life's moment we are living where bats with baby faces in the violet light whistled and beat their wings and crawled head downward down a blackened wall and upside down in air were towers tolling reminiscent bells that kept the hours and voices singing out of empty cisterns and exhausted wells. Today, when I read the modernist poems of my undergraduate degree of 20 years ago, I read them differently, as seeing the end of the digitized, hyper-capitalist, cruel, neoliberal world we are witnessing now. I see the mutilated wor world that Indigenous people saw in treaties. Cree chief Misimwaksa, Big Bear, felt that Treaty 6 would destroy his people's way of life and place. He refused to sign for seven years after it was made in 1876. He refused to sign because he knew that modernism was consigning his, him and his people and the land to what amounted to, quote, a noose around the neck. He knew that the colonialist and white man's view of land as property to conquer and capitalize on would eventually suck the air out of the trees, taking down a whole people and a pre-modern, post-modern way of life to which we may, I think we will, have no choice to return, and some of us gladly. The wasteland makes sense to me now as I learn that both Elliot and his wife were afflicted with the flu and that he wrote about and through it. Now I feel he saw the doom of humankind in the hollow man humanity that the capitalist age would wreak. Virginia Woolf was also stricken with the Spanish flu, and like a woman, a feminist, she set her sights on the body's pain, in our inability to conceive of the personal and collective meanings that illness signaled to us. In her essay on being ill, she opens with a majestic and poetic invocation to illness, describing our difficulties in coming to terms with, without having a language to speak of illness when we are caught in its throes. She writes, quote, Considering how common illness is, how tremendous the spiritual change it brings, how astonishing when the lights of health go down, the undiscovered countries that are then disclosed, what wastes and deserts of the soul a slight attack of influenza brings to light, what precipices and lawns sprinkled with bright flowers a little rise of temperature reveals, what ancient and obdurate oaks are uprooted in us in the act of sickness, how we go down into the pit of death and feel the waters of annihilation close above our heads and wake thinking to find ourselves in the presence of the angels and the harpers when we have a tooth out and come to the surface in the dentist's armchair and confuse his rinse the mouth, rinse the mouth, with the greeting of the deity stooping from the floor of heaven to welcome us, when we think of this and infinitely more, as we are so frequently forced to think of it, becomes strange indeed that illness has not taken its place with love, battle, and jealousy among the prime themes of literature. In On Being Ill, Wolf finds that literature has no time for the childishness of illness, nor does social commentary. Our language, which is even more so now, she writes, is too impoverished to deal with the harsh realities of illness. For this, she argues, as I am too arguing, we need to turn to the poets because... In illness, words, like Tagore's potions, possess a mystic quality. We grasp what is beyond their surface meaning, gather instinctively this and that and the other, a sound, a color, here a stress, there a pause, when the poet knowing words, too meager in comparison with ideas, has strewn about his page to evoke when collected a state of mind which neither words can express nor reason can explain incomprehensibility has an enormous power of us in illness more legitimately perhaps than the upright will allow end of quote how we learn to speak about the virus after it is over will be important to the future of the multi-species i will make the case for speaking about the continuation of our kind under the threat of extinction for more than just a virus in terms of breath in sanskrit breath means prana meaning life force, the principle by which all inanimate and animate things are made vital. In Hinduism, there are whole doctrines reserved for breathing based on an old Sanskrit proverb, for breath is life, and if you breathe well, you will live long on earth. Om is the symbol of breath. Namaste means I acknowledge the breath in you. In this time, I have fallen back on the mantras of my childhood, 
inexplicably chanting Om Vu Vua Swaha as a way to breathe when I felt gripped by symptomology in the early days, wiping down groceries, washing my hands until the skin on my fingers bled, avoiding all humans at all costs, even outdoors. I read Ilya Kaminsky's Deaf Republic, a poetics of witness that resounds breath in the silence and grief of a village struck down by a body politic with deafness, a refusal to hear the violence the social continues to ring out on a people. Observe this moment, Kaminsky writes, how it convulses, snow falls, and the dogs run into the streets like medics. Fourteen of us watch. Sonia kisses his forehead. Her should a hole torn in the sky. It shimmers the park benches, porch lights. We see in Sonia's open mouth the nakedness of a whole nation. I see the breath held in each of us in the world, resound in the child's breath snuffed out in Sonia's grief-stricken mouth. I feel our collective breath heave out of the body of every intubated person lying prone and gasping for air on stretchers across the globe in every city I can and cannot imagine. The thought of not being able to breathe mobilized me in those early days. I could hear the thought of losing it beseeching all of us to stop and think about every breath we anxiously took. What we learned during the pandemic is that we, and especially those who presume to know, don't know a lot about the sickness plaguing our world. But when institutions crumbled, what remained was the land. The air was clearer, the animals came back, the children played outdoors, the land held us together. The mystic insight was fleeting. Soon the anti-maskers rose up to take over capitals and parliaments, acting out their distrust with public health and science that had been steadily discounted by populists and strong men. Preaching the doctrine of herd immunity, reducing elderly life to Darwinian roulette, using children as a reason not to stay home, privileged segments of society upset about their nail appointments and their hair coiffure rioted en masse. The temporarily stricken big businesses rolled out their disaster capitalizing plans. As we watched family against family, group against group, engage in collective acting out, I wondered what would it take for the hatred to end? What would it take to value human life as a social good in of itself? What would it take for the breath in each of us to be held with the highest regard we can muster up, each for the other? During the summer of the pandemic and our global hypochondria, the words, I cannot breathe, writing Jericho Brown's bullet points, rang through my mind during the assassination of George Floyd. I will not shoot myself. I will not shoot myself. I will not hang myself. Reading the poem again leaves one gasping for air, as another poet, Hiro Kanagawa, notices and tweets. Quote, hearing Pulitzer Prize winning poet Jericho Brown read his poem Bullet Points was one of those experiences so powerful the silence rings in your ears for long moments afterwards and then you take a deep breath because you realize you forgot to breathe. End of quote. In Brown's poem, all the converges, com converges of unconscious personal social history overwhelm in the way that Du Bois had written about racial um, injustice during a pandemic in a century, in another time of great physical and social disease. I remember James Baldwin re remarking to Robert Cole that when racial injustice finally got to him, when the sickness hit the core of his being, he needed to leave America for good, or at least for a while. Quote, I had to leave. I needed to be in a place where I could breathe and not feel someone's hand on my throat. A lot of young Americans, white or black, rich or poor, have wanted to get away as a means of getting closer to themselves. For me, France was the beginning of a writing life. I wrote Go Tell It on the Mountain there. It was there I began the struggle with words. To learn to breathe is to struggle with words, which is the work of poetry. When ripped apart by thoughts of our own demise, the way racialized people, marked people, have known from an early age and for all their life. The comparisons are unfair, as the violence of intentional and brutal police violence against black men is unequal to that of a pandemic randomly striking the unsuspecting down. But the latter ought to enlarge in our capacities to condemn the former. 
We ought to know where our implication lies, as W. E. Bo uh, B. Du Bois also observed, in the acts that would have us preserve ourselves over the lives of others. It is deadening to continue to have to insist that this white way is harmful to all on the planet, like Chief Big Bear knew its poison would eventually suck the air out of everything. It is important for each of us to know our part in contributing to a human history of death and demise if the path is not altered soon. My father was a child of five when he realized that his childhood friends were dead and he was alive, and none of it was fair because only privilege cast education and history separated him from them. I was a child of five when he gave me a lesson on knowing that no one is luckier, better, more human than others. Some just have more resources, opportunities, and chances to be so from the beginning. While other scholars were thinking about new forms of teaching and learning remotely, and how education was about to be revolutionized by digital and technological forums, I became consumed with breath, how to think it, how to study, how to make it examinable, how to recenter breathing as the primary educational activity of our lives. I could not think of pivoting online or becoming hybrid as a disaster capitalizing university managers asked us to, to do. I totally retreated from the dog wars erupting in faculties as the overworked and under-resourced of the collegium began to protest while the administrators grinned and winked about how best to embark on their attack on the mine, on the sleeping professoriate. In this self-imposed solitary seclusion, all I could do is think, think, think of air. I, like so many of you, have experienced what it is like not to be able to breathe, for a few seconds even. It could be smog, a chest full of water while swimming, an attack by allergens, hyperventilating under duress. I suffered from anemia, and one summer it got so bad I literally could not get enough air in my lungs. Rushed to emergency, I uttered the words that so many are uttering on their deathbeds. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. When news struck of people on ventilators, old people in long-term care, people alone in hospital rooms, all I could think of is the terror of being totally out of breath and not being able to come up for air. As with the Spanish flu, a period of human wars, deadly racial violence, and industri industrialization gave way to mass factory farming and the marketing of animals, and to some extent, human life. It might take a pandemic to support us to examine the importance of breath, of attending to it, observing it, engaging it educationally, pedagogically, in every aspect of our work. And I have turned to poetry to relearn to breathe, because Ada Limon reminds me, quote, Poetry has breath built right into it, thanks to the line break and the stanza. And here we breathe a little, the poem says. And here we breathe a lot. Right now, as a society, I think we need that breath, that necessary pause that allows for our own wrecked little selves to enter the poem, or even just return to the room where we are presently in. That particular moment is where the real brilliance of great poetry happens. Stephen Colbert, Lehman continues, in a recent Colbert report said, folks, I've said it before, I love breathing. I could do it all day long. And he's right, or rather the joke is right, because we do it naturally to survive. We forget the importance of a deeper breath, a quieter second. It's easy to forget the importance of just being here in the world, noticing something, being grateful of something, acknowledging the pain of something. Throughout our sorry modern history of human violence, it is stirring words, usually of a single person, that remind us of who we are deep down inside, fragile, failed, vulnerable creatures we feel ourselves to be. The literary and creative arts, I argue, th through all my work, can teach us to imagine new visions and vocabularies of felt existence. It teaches us we can and must adapt to what the earth is telling us. The way to reimagine the world is to regrow our children with regenerating stories to teach our children to read the world through a literary and poetic frame to open their mind. To renew sustained faith in the literary, in poetry, storytelling, and literature is increasingly a radical pedagogical act. None of us can afford not to read, to use this new and refound knowledge to imagine, dream, think, engage, and renew the world. We need a deeply affecting education that sustains us to refine, to retell our humanity, and we need it now. 
I leave the last word to Jericho Brown, whose poetry I urge you to read, dear graduate students, as it carries me through this time. The poems he offers is one I made my son recite as he grew more and more agitated with thoughts of never being able to return back to all the world holds for him. I urged, I urged him to look outward, think outward, to imagine that big, wild, populated world that he so desperately wants to be in. For me, an enlarged imagination is a, is a changed mind. It is to realize one is not alone in fighting the things poisoning our air, social hatred, viruses, the smog, pollutions, toxics, killing each other in the land. It is in a way to enlarge in the, the imagination is to lose some things like a killing capitalism and its deadly infectious whiteness that can no longer hold and, and to reopen others to elemental ones like air, sunshine, water, sharing, and friendship. And I think poetry can teach us this even as it purports us to teach nothing, which to me is the most powerful pedagogy we can experience. So I leave you with two words that have gotten me through the most imaginal, imaginable times of my life as, as rewritten uh, by the poet Jericho Brown. Say thank you, say I'm sorry. I don't know whose side you're on, but I am here for the people who work in grocery stores that glow in the morning and close down for deep cleaning at night, right up the street and in cities I mispronounce, in towns too tiny for my big black car to quit, and in every wide corner of Kansas where going to school means at least one field trip to a slaughterhouse. I want so little, another leather-bound book, a gimlet with a lavender gin, bread so good when I taste it, I can tell you how it's made. I'd like us to think what it is to be a nation. I'm in a mood about America. Today I have PTSD about the Lord. God save the people who work in grocery stores. They know a bit of glamour is a lot of glamour. They know how much it costs for the eldest of us to eat. Save my loves and not my sentences. Before I see them, I draw a mole near, near my left dimple. Add flair to the smile they can't see behind my mask. I grin or lie, or maybe I wear the mouth of a beast. I eat wild animals while some of us growing up knowing what Noki is. The people who work at the grocery don't care. They say thank you. They say sorry. We don't sell motor oil anymore with a grief so thick you could touch it. Go on, touch it. It is early. It is late. They have washed their hands. They have washed their hands for you. And they take the bus home. When we emerge from the pandemic, poet Dion Brand finds, we will have to reckon with the mess we have made of the shared world we live. Education, Toni Morrison insists, must be to refuse to continue to produce generation after generation of people trained to make expedient rather than humane ones. Another world is not only possible, Arundhati Roy poetically reminds me, not unlike my son. She is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Our first word begins and ends with a poem. We need to relearn our elemental humanity. It's not too late. The first thing is to breathe.